In the last lecture, I presented the Tenet hydrological method, which we learned was based on best practice holistic methodologies of the 1960s and 1970s, but which oversimplified the flow regime by recommending only seasonal minimum flow thresholds and a relatively small flushing flow. By the mid-1990s, the eFlow scientific community understood that preservation of multiple components of a river's natural flow regime is necessary to meet most environmental objectives set for river management. Detailed studies and knowledge of flow ecology relationships are needed to distinguish confidently between more or less important components of the flow regime, and we'll discuss these approaches in the next two units. But first, let's look at two hydrological methods that are based on the natural flow paradigm and thus enable the quantification of all or most components of a river's flow regime. In the absence of sufficient understanding of flow ecology relationships, this is the only means of making high confidence eFlows recommendations using only hydrological approaches. Both methods were developed by scientists at the Nature Conservancy, led by Brian Richter and in cooperation with a number of partners. The first is the Range of Variability Approach, or RVA, which was published in 1997, one year after publication of the Indicators of Hydraulic Alteration, and in the same year the Natural Flow Paradigm was published. The IHA parameters are the basis for the RVA, which uses them to set flow management targets to restore more natural flow regimes in heavily modified systems. The approach is one of the first to include direct cooperation with water managers, especially dam operators, among the steps in the methodology. It was groundbreaking then and launched a partnership between the Nature Conservancy and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that continues today and has brought a wealth of new knowledge and implementation experience to the eFlows community. More about that later. The second method is the percent of flow, or POF, approach. While the approach is simpler than RVA, it was published more recently and is an elegant means of quickly setting precautionary and understandable eFlow standards everywhere. The approach introduces the concept of sustainability boundaries, which define ranges of allowable alteration from natural conditions. Let's address the percent of flow approach first. The concept of percent of flow is simple and straightforward beginning with the acknowledgement that the full annual and interannual variability of the natural flow regime is the master variable in meeting flow requirements of native species and ecosystem processes. Thus, maintaining the natural flow regime provides the highest level of ecological protection. Any departure from any component of the natural flow regime, whether it be more or less water, increases the risk of ecological harm and degradation. Based on the review of case studies from three U.S. states and the EU, Richter and his colleagues proposed that for a high level of ecological protection, alteration of natural flows be limited to a 10% departure from natural. And for a moderate level of ecological protection, alteration be limited to a 20% departure from natural. In this approach, percent deviations from natural are ideally to be quantified, monitored, and managed on a daily basis. Monthly time steps are also possible at a planning level, but plans should still be based on a knowledge of the daily patterns associated with each month. This is necessary to avoid too frequently allocating water that is not actually present in the river because the estimates of availability are based on averages. We saw this same challenge in the implementation of the tenant method, also based on averages, but at an annual level which introduces even more skewed figures. The authors of this method acknowledge that many water managers will find it challenging to apply this precautionary approach. They also acknowledge that these standards uh, will most realistically serve as temporary, conservative default placeholders for eFlow standards until more customized approaches can be applied locally and regionally. To hear a bit more about this approach from the lead author, Brian Richter, see the video link in the additional resources section of this unit. Brian mentions the presumptive standard as part of a longer lecture on understanding environmental flows. I've provided the URL for the full lecture as well. 
The range of variability approach, like the percent to flow approach, is intended for application in river systems where environmental objectives include conservation of native aquatic biodiversity and protection of natural ecosystem functions. But it's structured to take advantage of IHA parameters to define management targets based on the full range of ecologically relevant components of the natural flow regime. Step one is to apply IHA and quantify the 32 parameters listed in the table to the right. You've already seen these in a Unit 6 lecture and your initial practice with the IHA software. Step two involves setting management targets for each of the 32 parameters, ensuring that the management flow regime does not exceed established ranges of variability for any target. Ideally, the ranges of acceptable variability will be based on knowledge of flow ecology relationships in the published scientific literature. In lieu of this knowledge, the author suggests establishing initial ranges of plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean value of each parameter. This corresponds to targets that would naturally be met approximately 68% of the time, or approximately 7 out of every 10 years. Based on these targets, step three calls for establishing dam release rules or a broader management system to enable the attainment of targets in most years. Rules for releases from individual dams are straightforward, but subject to many competing interests. So elevating environmental targets to decisive levels will require influence and crea creativity. When multiple dams or numbers of off-channel abstractors are involved, a broader systems approach is needed to meet targets. We'll see some of the latest systems approaches when we reach the implementation units of the course. Step four highlights the importance of monitoring and continuing to increase our knowledge base through research. Given its purely hydrological basis, the RBA is intended only to set initial river management targets. Step four sets in motion a process of refining the targets by monitoring whether management interventions are meeting the targets each year and by conducting research to fill recognized knowledge gaps. From this hydrological basis, the approach to quantifying and managing e-flows will evolve into a holistic approach. Steps five and six reinforce this adaptive approach emphasizing specifically the need to carefully review annual monitoring data and revise the management system based on what is learned and new research inputs. The Roanoke River is used as a case study for the initial application of the method. You have access to these results as well because you use the Roanoke dataset in the tutorial for the IHA software. The analysis distinguishes between the pre-dam hydrological regime from 1912 to 1952 and a post-dam altered regime from 1953 until 2004. In this method, Richter and his colleagues recommend using a pre-dam data series of at least 20 years. But if not available, the method can be adapted to use data regionalized from reference sites or simulated using rainfall runoff models. The figures on this slide present the default approach to apply RVA. In the absence of management targets based on detailed flow ecology knowledge, they recommend defining the target range based on one standard deviation above or below the mean value of each parameter for the pre-dam period. These graphics present three of the most heavily altered parameters in the record, which represent large floods. The natural pattern of large floods persisting for one, three, and seven days are shown in green. The dashed line is the median value of the pre-dam period, and the solid lines mark the upper and lower boundaries of the one standard deviation range. The upper and lower one standard deviation boundaries extend across the post-dam period as well, but we see that nearly all data post-dam fall outside this range. In fact, 100% of one-day and three-day maximum values for post-dam years fall below the lower threshold, and 89% of seven-day maximum values fall below the lower threshold. This indicates that regulation of the river has eliminated all large floods from the system. Now, this may be advantageous from a public safety perspective if construction has occurred in the historical floodplain, but it has detrimental ecological consequences because large floods 
are important to maintain channel morphology and rejuvenate floodplain areas. They likely also serve as cues for the initiation of other aspects of the life history of native species in the system. Regulation of the river has also altered the timing of high and low flow patterns in the system. These figures indicate changes in flows during the month of March. Before regulation of the Roanoke River, the months of February through April provided fairly consistent and predictable levels of higher flows compared to other months, including a concentration of floods. This is important for preparing spawning areas for the striped bass shown in the photo on the left. Spawning begins in April and extends through June. The smiles on the faces of this family indicate the importance of this species for recreation and connecting culturally to local ecosystems. Striped bass were also an important commercial species historically in the lower sections of the Roanoke River. The commercial striped bass fishery is now closed due to a combination of factors, including regulation of river flows in a manner disadvantageous to striped bass spawning and recruitment. The curves on the top figure show the duration that different flow levels were expected pre-dam in green and post-dam in black. Notice the reduction in infrequent pre-dam flood flows on the left side of the graph and the reduction in what were stable high flows on the right side of the graph. The plot of monthly flow values for March on the lower graph actually show a slight increase in the median value of flow, but also an increase in variability. Reliable floods and high base flows that occurred historically during March have now become more variable, less certain, and reduced at flood and base flow levels. Significant alterations are also observed in low flow magnitude and timing. The curves on the upper left show that minimum flows became more pronounced after regulation of the river, although they recovered in magnitude during the later years of the record. The curves on the lower left, however, indicate that the duration of these low flow periods has dropped almost entirely below the target range. The figure on the upper right shows that the timing of minimum flows in the river used to be very consistent and concentrated from mid-September into October. Those dates have become more variable, and the median has clearly shifted to later in the year. Another dramatic impact on the flow of the river is shown in the figure on the lower right. The number of times that flow, uh, low flows occur per year in the river has increased by a factor of three since flow alteration. Large changes in the number of high flow pulses have also occurred. Together, these have resulted in a much higher number of reversals in flow levels compared to historical conditions. All of these flow factors induce stress in aquatic ecosystems evolved to succeed in the conditions represented by the pre-dam parameters. So, based on the analysis of flow alteration in the Roanoke River, the EFLOWS team can recommend changes to the flow releases of John H. Kerr Dam, which largely controls flows downstream of the river system. The first recommendation is to restore high magnitude flooding, which we saw has been completely eliminated in the system. Next, they recommend that these floods be released in the period from February to April, when they occurred historically. Likewise, the timing of low flow extremes should be returned to the period of September and October when they occurred naturally. We saw that these flow extremes now occur mainly in December. To restore more natural flow conditions, the number of high and low flow pulses needs to be reduced, but the duration of the reduced number needs to be increased. Currently, there's an excessive number of short-term pulses. This is likely due to management decisions influenced mainly by objectives of hydropower generation. Thus, the final two recommendations call for changes to hydropower operational rules to decrease the frequency of reversals in hydrograph levels and also to moderate rates of change in flow levels. This set of recommendations and the management targets motivating them call for significant changes in the operation of the dam. In class, we've now traced a 100-year history of fisheries biologists advising dam operators on changes in flow releases needed to restore and protect downstream ecosystems. We've seen that dam operators rarely adopt the recommendations of fisheries biologists. But over this 100-year period, 
there's also been a change in broader public sentiment and environmental laws have strengthened incrementally. We've also seen new forms of partnership appear, as demonstrated by the long-term cooperation of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Nature Conservancy. Combined, these factors are producing change, not only in the USA, but around the world. In 2016, the decision was made to change the operational rules of Cara Dam and adopt a so-called quasi-run-of-river approach to managing flow releases. We'll look at this more closely in the implementation units of the course, but for those of you eager to read ahead, I've included in the Additional Resources folder the report of the environmental assessment evaluating several alternatives to modify dam operation and recommending the quasi-run-of-river option. And now for the take-home messages for this lecture. First, we've learned that best practice hydrology eFlows methods are based on the natural flow paradigm and consider the full range of hydrological variability. The percent to flow approach is based on average daily flow data and established sustainability boundaries limiting the degree of alteration of flows. It's intended as a temporary placeholder for eFlow standards until more customized approaches can be applied. The range of variability approach is based on the 32 parameters of the IHA software. It determines degree of alteration in a system and sets flow management targets to restore missing components. It also proposes modifications in flow management to meet targets as part of an adaptive management process. Both of these best practice approaches recognize that eFlow recommendations based solely on hydrological considerations must include the full range of natural variability in flows because the relative importance of different components cannot be determined without knowledge of flow ecology relationships. This requirement to protect the full regime constrains water resource managers, limiting the degree to which they can respond to other water demands. This is why hydrological methods are intended only to set initial or temporary flow requirements. More detailed custom assessments are required to identify the most ecologically important components of a flow regime and thereby to free up other components for use by other demands. The customization of eFlow's recommendations using habitat modeling and holistic approaches is the topic of our next two units. That's the end of this lecture. Thanks very much.